The Winds of Winter Ariane On the morning that she left the water gardens, her father rose from his chair to kiss her on both cheeks. The fate of Dorn goes with you, daughter, he said as he pressed the parchment into her hand. Go swiftly, go safely, be my eyes and ears and voice, but most of all, take care. I will, father. She did not shed a tear. Ariane Martel was a princess of Dorn, and Dornishmen did not waste water lightly. It was a near thing, though. It was not her father's kisses nor his hoarse words that made her eyes glisten, but the effort that brought him to his feet, his legs trembling under him, his joints swollen and inflamed with gout. Standing was an act of love. Standing was an act of faith. He believes in me. I will not fail him. Seven of them set out together on seven Dornish sand steeds. A small party travels more swiftly than a large one, but the heir to Dorn does not ride alone. From God's grace came Sir Damon Sand, the bastard, once Prince Oberon's squire, now Ariane's sworn shield. From Sunspear, two bold young knights, Joss Hood and Garibald Shells, to lend their swords to his. From the water gardens, seven ravens and a tall young lad to tend them. His name was Nate, but he had been working with the birds so long that no one called him anything but feathers. And since a princess must have some women to attend her, her company also included Pretty Jane Ladybright and Wild Elia Sand, a maid of ten and four. They struck out north by northwest, across dry lands and parched plains and pale sands toward Ghost Hill, the stronghold of House Tolland, where the ship that would take them across the Sea of Dorne awaited them. "'Send the raven whenever you have news,' Prince Doran told her. "'But report only what you know to be true. We are lost in fog here.' besieged by rumors, falsehoods, and travelers' tales. I dare not act until I know for a certainty what is happening. War is happening, thought Ariane, and this time Dorn will not be spared. Doom and death are coming, Elaria Sand had warned them, before she took her own leave from Prince Doran. It is time for my little snakes to scatter, the better to survive the carnage. Ilaria was returning to her father's seat at Hellholt. With her went her daughter Loreza, who had just turned seven. Doria remained at the water gardens, one child amongst a hundred. Obella was to be dispatched to Sunspear to serve as a cupbearer to the wife of the Castellan, Manfrey Martell. And Elia Sand, oldest of the four girls that Prince Oberon had fathered on Ilaria, would cross the Sea of Dorn with Ariane. As a lady, not a lance, her mother said firmly. But like all the sand snakes, Elia had her own mind. They crossed the sands in two long days and the better part of two nights, stopping thrice to change their horses. It was a lonely time for Ariane, surrounded by so many strangers. Elia was her cousin, but half a child, and Damon Sand. Things had never been the same between her and the bastard of God's grace after her father refused his offer for her hand. He was a boy then, and bastard born. No fit consort for a princess of Dorn. He should have known better. And it was my father's will, not mine. The rest of her companions she hardly knew at all. Ariane missed her friends. Dre and Garin and her sweet-spotted Silva had been a part of her since she was little. Trusted confidants who had shared her dreams and secrets, cheered her when she was sad, helped her face her fears. One of them had betrayed her, but she missed them all the same. It was my own fault. Ariane had made them part of her plot to steal off with Myrcella Baratheon and crown her queen, an act of rebellion meant to force her father's hand, but someone's loose tongue had undone her. 
The clumsy conspiracy had accomplished nothing, except to cost poor Marcella part of her face, and Sir Eris Ocard his life. Arion missed Sir Eris, too, more than she ever would have thought. He loved me madly, she told herself, yet I was never more than fond of him. I made use of him in my bed and in my plot, took his love and took his honor, gave him nothing but my body. In the end, he could not live with what we'd done. Why else would her white knight have charged right into Ario Hota's long axe to die the way he did? I was a foolish, willful girl, playing at the Game of Thrones like a drunkard rolling dice. The cost of her folly had been dear. Dre had been sent across the world to Norvos, Garen exiled to Tyrosh for two years, her sweet, silly, smiling Silva married off to Eldon Estermont, a man old enough to be her grandsire. Sir Eris had paid with his life's blood, Myrcella with an ear. Only Sir Gerald Dane had escaped unscathed. Dark Star. If Marcella's horse had not shied at the last instant, his longsword would have opened her from chest to waist instead of just taking off her ear. Dane was her most grievous sin, the one that Ariane most regretted. With one stroke of his sword, he had changed her botched plot into something foul and bloody. If the gods were good, by now Obara Sand had treed him in his mountain fastness and put an end to him. She said as much to Daemon Sand that first night as they made camp. "'Be careful what you pray for, princess,' he replied. "'Darkstar could put an end to Lady Obara just as easily. "'She has Ario Hota with her.' Prince Doran's captain of guards had dispatched Sir Eris Ocart with a single blow, though the king's guard were supposed to be the finest knights in all the realm. "'No man can stand against Hota.' Is that what Dark Star is? A man? Sir Daemon grimaced. A man would not have done what he did to Princess Marcella. Sir Gerald is more a viper than your uncle ever was. Prince Oberyn could see that he was poison. He said so more than once. It's just a pity that he never got around to killing him. Poison, thought Ariane. Yes, pretty poison, though. That was how he'd fooled her. Gerald Dane was hard and cruel, but so fair to look upon that the princess had not believed half the tales she'd heard of him. Pretty boys had ever been her weakness, particularly the ones who were dark and dangerous as well. That was before, when I was just a girl, she told herself. I am a woman now, my father's daughter. I have learned that lesson. Come break of day, they were off again. Elia Sand led the way, her black braid flying behind her as she raced across the dry, cracked plains and up into the hills. The girl was mad for horses, which might be why she often smelled like one to the despair of her mother. Sometimes Ariane felt sorry for Ilaria. Four girls and every one of them her father's daughter. The rest of the party kept a more sedate pace. The princess found herself riding beside Sir Daemon, remembering other rides when they were younger, rides that often ended in embraces. When she found herself stealing glances at him, tall and gallant in the saddle, Ariane reminded herself that she was heir to Dorn, and him no more than her shield. "'Tell me what you know of this John Connington,' she commanded. "'He's dead,' said Daemon Sand. "'He died in the disputed lands. Of drink, I've heard it said.' "'So a dead drunk leads this army? "'Perhaps this John Connington is a son of that one, "'or just some clever sellsword who has taken on a dead man's name. "'Or he never died at all. "'Could Connington have been pretending to be dead for all these years?' That would require patience worthy of her father. The thought made Ariane uneasy. Treating with a man that subtle could be perilous. What was he like before he... 
before he died. I was a boy at God's grace when he was sent into exile. I never knew the man. Then tell me what you've heard of him from others. As my princess commands. Conington was lord of Griffin's Roost when Griffin's Roost was still a lordship worth the having. Prince Rhaegar's squire, or one of them. Later Prince Rhaegar's friend and companion. The Mad King named him Han during Robert's rebellion, but he was defeated at Stony Sept in the Battle of the Bells, and Robert slipped away. King Aris was wroth, and sent Conington into exile. There he died. Or not. Prince Doran had told her all of that. There must be more. Those are just the things he did. I know all that. What sort of man was he? Honest and honorable? Venal and grasping? Proud? Proud, for a certainty. Even arrogant. A faithful friend to Rhaegar, but prickly with others. Robert was his liege, but I've heard it said that Conington chafed at serving such a lord. Even then, Robert was known to be fond of wine and whores. No whores for Lord John, then? I could not say. Some men keep their whoring secret. Did he have a wife? A paramour? Sir Damon shrugged. Not that I have ever heard. That was troubling, too. Sir Eris Oakard had broken his vows for her, but it did not sound as if John Connington could be similarly swayed. Can I match such a man with words alone? The princess lapsed into silence, all the while pondering what she would find at Journey's End. That night, when they made camp, she crept into the tent she shared with Jane Ladybright and Elia Sand and slipped a bit of parchment out of her sleeve to read the words again. To Prince Doran of House Martell, you will remember me, I pray. I knew your sister well and was a leal servant of your good brother. I grieve for them as you do. I did not die, no more than did your sister's son. To save his life we kept him hidden, but the time for hiding is done. A dragon has returned to Westeros to claim his birthright and seek vengeance for his father and for the Princess Elia, his mother. In her name I turn to Dorne. Do not forsake us. John Connington, Lord of Griffin's Roost, Hand of the True King. Ariane read the letter thrice, then rolled it up and tucked it back into her sleeve. A dragon has returned to Westeros, but not the dragon my father was expecting. Nowhere in the words was there a mention of Daenerys Stormborn, nor of Prince Quentin, her brother, who had been sent to seek the Dragon Queen. The princess remembered how her father had pressed the onyx Sivas piece into her palm, his voice hoarse and low as he confessed his plan. A long and perilous voyage, with an uncertain welcome at its end, he had said. He has gone to bring us back our heart's desire. Vengeance, justice, fire and blood. Fire and blood was what John Connington, if indeed it was him, was offering as well. Or was it? He comes with sellswords, but no dragons, Prince Doran had told her, the night the raven came. The Golden Company is the best and largest of the free companies, but ten thousand mercenaries cannot hope to win the Seven Kingdoms. Elia's son. I would weep for joy if some part of my sister had survived, but... What proof do we have that this is Aegon? His voice broke when he said that. Where are the dragons? He asked. Where is Daenerys? And Arianne knew that he was really saying, Where is my son? In the bone way in the prince's pass, two Dornish hosts had massed, and there they sat, sharpening their spears, polishing their armor, Dicing, drinking, quarreling, their numbers dwindling by the day, waiting, waiting, 
waiting for the Prince of Dorne to loose them on the enemies of House Martell, waiting for the dragons, for fire and blood, for me. One word from Ariane and those armies would march, so long as that word was dragon. If instead the word she sent was war, Lord Ironwood and Lord Fowler and their armies would remain in place. The Prince of Dorne was nothing if not subtle. Here, war meant wait. At mid-morning on the third day, Ghost Hill loomed up before them, its chalk-white walls shining against the deep blue of the Sea of Dorne. From the square towers at the castle's corners flew the banners of House Tolland, a green dragon biting its own tail upon a golden field. The sun and spear of House Martell streamed atop the great central keep, gold and red and orange, defiant. Ravens had flown ahead to warn Lady Tolland of their coming, so the castle gates were open, and Nimella's eldest daughter rode forth with her steward to meet them near the bottom of the hill. Tall and fierce, with a blaze of bright red hair tumbling about her shoulders, Valena Tolland greeted Ariane with a shout of, Come at last, have you? How slow are those horses? Swift enough to outrun yours to the castle gates? We will see about that. Valena wheeled her big red around and put her heels into him, and the race was on. Through the dusty lanes of the village at the bottom of the hill, as chickens and villagers alike scrambled out of their path, Ariane was three horse lengths behind by the time she got her mare up to a gallop, but she had closed to one halfway up the slope. The two of them were side by side as they thundered toward the gatehouse, but five yards from the gates, Elia Sand came flying from the cloud of dust behind them to rush past both of them on her black filly. "'Are you half-horse, child?' Valena asked, laughing in the yard. "'Princess, did you bring a stable girl?' "'I'm Elia,' the girl announced." Lady Lance. Whoever hung that name on her has much to answer for. Like as not, it had been Prince Oberon, though, and the Red Viper had never answered to anyone but himself. The girl Jouster, Valena said. Yes, I've heard of you. Since you were the first to the yard, you've won the honor of watering and bridling the horses, and after that find the bathhouse said Princess Ariane. Elia was chalk and dust from heels to hair. That night Ariane and her knights supped with Lady Nimella and her daughters in the great hall of the castle. Teora, the younger girl, had the same red hair as her sister, but elsewise could not have been more different. Short, plump, and so shy she might have passed for a mute, she displayed more interest in the spiced beef and honeyed duck than in the comely young knights at the table, and seemed content to let her mother and her sister speak for House Tolland. "'We have heard the same tales here that you have heard at Sunspear,' Lady Nimella told them as her serving man poured the wine. "'Cell swords landing on Cape Wrath, castles under siege or being taken, crops seized or burned. Where these men come from and who they are, no one is certain. Pirates and adventurers we heard at first, said Valena. Then it was supposed to be the Golden Company. Now it's said to be John Connington, the Mad King's Hand, come back from the grave to reclaim his birthright. Whoever it is, Griffin's Roost has fallen to them. Rainhouse, Crow's Nest, Mistwood, even Greenstone on its island all taken. Ariane's thoughts went at once to her sweet-spotted Silva. Who would want Greenstone? Was there a battle? Not as we have heard, but all the tales are garbled. Tarth has fallen too, some fisher folk will tell you, said Valena. These cell swords now hold most of Cape Wrath and half the stepstones. We hear talk of elephants in the rainwood. Elephants? Ariane did not know what to think of that. Are you certain? Not dragons? Elephants, Lady Nimella said firmly. 
and krakens off the broken arm pulling under crippled galleys, said Valena. The blood draws them to the surface, our maester claims. There are bodies in the water. A few have washed up on our shores, and that's not half of it. A new pirate king is set up on Torturer's Deep. The Lord of the Waters, he styles himself. This one has real warships, three deckers monstrous large. You were wise not to come by sea. Since the red wine fleet passed through the stepstones, those waters are crawling with strange sails, all the way north to the Straits of Tarth and Shipbreaker Bay. Meermen, Volantines, Lyseni, even reavers from the Iron Islands. Some have entered the Sea of Dorne to land men on the south shore of Cape Wrath. We found a good fast ship for you as your father commanded, but even so... Be careful. It is true, then. Ariane wanted to ask after her brother, but her father had urged her to watch every word. If these ships had not brought Quentin home again with his dragon queen, best not to mention him. Only her father and a few of his most trusted men knew about her brother's mission to Slaver's Bay. Lady Tolland and her daughters were not amongst them. If it were Quentin... He would have brought Daenerys back to Dorne, surely. Why would he risk a landing on Cape Wrath amongst the Storm Lords? Is Dorne at risk? Lady Nimella asked. I confess, each time I see a strange sail, my heart leaps to my throat. What if these ships turn south? The best part of the Toland strength is with Lord Ironwood and the Boneway. Who will defend Ghost Hill if these strangers land upon our shores? Should I call my men home? Your men are needed where they are, my lady, Daemon Sand assured her. Ariane was quick to nod. Any other council could well lead to Lord Ironwood's host unraveling like an old tapestry, as each man rushed home to defend his own lands against supposed enemies who might or might not ever come. Once we know beyond a doubt whether these be friends or foes, my father will know what to do, the princess said. It was then that pasty, pudgy Teora raised her eyes from the cream cakes on her plate. It is dragons. Dragons, said her mother. Teora, don't be mad. I'm not. They're coming. How could you possibly know that? Her sister asked, with a note of scorn in her voice. One of your little dreams? Teora gave a tiny nod, chin trembling. They were dancing in my dream, and everywhere the dragons danced, the people died. Seven save us. Lady Nimella gave an exasperated sigh. If you did not eat so many cream cakes, you would not have such dreams. Rich foods are not for girls your age, when your humors are so unbalanced. Maester Tolman says, I hate Maester Tolman, Teora said. Then she bolted from the table, leaving her lady mother to make apologies for her. Be gentle with her, my lady, Ariane said. I remember when I was her age. My father despaired of me, I'm sure. I can attest to that. Sir Daemon took a cup of wine and said, How stolen does a dragon on its banners? A dragon eating its own tail, aye, Valena said, from the days of Aegon's conquest. He did not conquer here. Elsewhere he burned his foes, him and his sisters, but here we melted away before them leaving only stone and sand for them to burn. And round and round the dragons went, snapping at their tails for want of any other food, till they were tied in knots. Our forebears played their part in that, Lady Nimella said proudly. Bold deeds were done and brave men died. All of it was written down by the maesters who served us. We have books, if my princess would like to know more. Some other time, perhaps, said Ariane. As Ghost Hill slept that night, 
The princess donned a hooded cloak against the chill and walked to the castle battlements to clear her thoughts. Dame on Sand found her leaning on a parapet and gazing out to sea, where the moon was dancing on the water. Princess, he said, you ought to be a bed. I could say the same of you. Ariane turned to gaze upon his face. A good face, she decided. The boy I knew has become a handsome man. His eyes were as blue as a desert sky, his hair the light brown of the sands they had just crossed. A close-cropped beard followed the chin of a strong jaw, but could not quite hide the dimples when he smiled. I always loved his smile. The Bastard of God's Grace was one of Dorne's finest swords as well as might be expected from one who had been Prince Oberon's squire and had received his knighthood from the Red Viper himself. Some said that he had been her uncle's lover, too, though seldom to his face. Ariane did not know the truth of that. He had been her lover, though. At fourteen, she had given him her maidenhead. Daemon had not been much older, so their couplings had been as clumsy as they were ardent. Still... It had been sweet. Ariane gave him her most seductive smile. We might share a bed together. Sir Daemon's face was stone. Have you forgotten, princess? I am bastard born. He took her hand in his. If I am unworthy of this hand, how can I be worthy of your cunt? She snatched her hand away. You deserve a slap for that. My face is yours. Do what you will. What I will, you will not, it seems. So be it. Talk with me instead. Could this truly be Prince Aegon? Gregor Clegane ripped Aegon out of Elia's arms and smashed his head against a wall, Sir Daemon said. If Lord Conington's prince has a crushed skull, I will believe that Aegon Targaryen has returned from the grave. Elsewise, no. This is some feigned boy, no more. A sellsword's ploy to win support. My father fears the same. If not, though, if this truly is John Connington, if the boy is Rhaegar's son... Are you hoping that he is or that he's not? I... It would give great joy to my father if Elia's son were still alive. He loved his sister well. It was you I asked about, not your father. So it was. I was seven when Elia died. They say I held her daughter Rhaenys once, when I was too young to remember. Aegon will be a stranger to me, whether true or false. The princess paused. We looked for Rhaegar's sister, not his son. Her father had confided in Sir Daemon when he chose him as his daughter's shield. With him, at least, she could speak freely. I would sooner it were Quentin who'd returned. Or so you say, said Daemon Sand. Good night, princess. He bowed to her and left her standing there. What did he mean by that? Ariane watched him walk away. What sort of sister would I be if I did not want my brother back? It was true, she had resented Quentin for all those years that she had thought their father meant to name him as his heir in place of her, but that had turned out to be just a misunderstanding. She was the heir to Dorne. She had her father's word on that. Quentin would have his dragon queen, Daenerys. In Sunspear hung a portrait of the Princess Daenerys who had come to Dorne to marry one of Ariane's forebears. In her younger days, Ariane had spent hours gazing at it, back when she was just a pudgy, flat-chested girl on the cusp of maidenhood who prayed every night for the gods to make her pretty. A hundred years ago, Daenerys Targaryen came to Dorne to make a peace. Now another comes to make a war and my brother will be her king and consort, King Quentin. Why did that sound so silly? Almost as silly as Quentin riding on a dragon. Her brother was an earnest boy, well-behaved and dutiful, but dull. 
and plain, so plain. The gods had given Ariane the beauty she had prayed for, but Quentin must have prayed for something else. His head was over large and sort of square, his hair the color of dried mud, his shoulders slumped as well, and he was too thick about the middle. He looks too much like father. I love my brother, said Ariane, though only the moon could hear her. Though if truth be told, she scarcely knew him. Quentin had been fostered by Lord Anders of House Ironwood, the Blood Royal, the son of Lord Ormond Ironwood and grandson of Lord Edgar. In his youth, her uncle Oberyn had fought a duel with Edgar, had given him a wound that mortified and killed him. Afterward, men called him the Red Viper and spoke of poison on his blade. The Ironwoods were an ancient house, proud and powerful. Before the coming of the Roinar, they had been kings over half of Dorne, with domains that dwarfed those of House Martell. Blood feud and rebellion would surely have followed Lord Edgar's death, had not her father acted at once. The Red Viper went to Old Town, thence across the narrow sea to Lease, though none dared called it exile. And in due time, Quentin was given to Lord Anders to foster as a sign of trust. That helped to heal the breach between Sunspear and the Ironwoods, but it had opened new ones between Quentin and the Sand Snakes, and Ariane had always been closer to her cousins than to her distant brother. We are still the same blood, though, she whispered. Of course I want my brother home. I do. The wind off the sea was raising goose prickles all up and down her arms. Ariane pulled her cloak about herself and went off to seek her bed. Their ship was called the Peregrine. They sailed upon the morning tide. The gods were good to them, the sea calm. Even with good winds, the crossing took a day and a night. Jane Ladybright grew greensick and spent most of the voyage spewing, which Elia Sand seemed to find hilarious. Someone needs to spank that child, Joss Hood was heard to say, but Elia was amongst those who heard him say it. I am almost a woman grown, sir, she responded haughtily. I'll let you spank me, though, but first you'll need to tilt with me and knock me off my horse. We are on a ship and without horses, Joss replied, and ladies do not joust insisted Sir Garibald Shells, a far more serious and proper young man than his companion. I do. I'm Lady Lance. Ariane had heard enough. You may be a Lance, but you are no lady. Go below and stay there till we reach land. Elsewise, the crossing was uneventful. At dusk, they spied a galley in the distance, her oars rising and falling against the evening stars, but she was moving away from them, and soon dwindled and was gone. Ariane played a game of Sivas with Sir Daemon, and another with Garibald Shells, and somehow managed to lose both. Sir Garibald was kind enough to say that she had played a gallant game, but Daemon mocked her. You have other pieces beside the dragon, princess. Try moving them sometime. I like the dragon. She wanted to slap the smile off his face. Or kiss it off, perhaps. The man was as smug as he was comely. Of all the knights in Dorn, why did my father choose this one to be my shield? He knows our history. It is just a game. Tell me of Prince Viserys. The beggar king? Sir Daemon seemed surprised. Everyone says that Prince Rhaegar was beautiful. Was Viserys beautiful as well? I suppose. He was Targaryen. I never saw the man. The secret pact that Prince Doran had made all those years ago called for Ariane to be wed to Prince Viserys, not Quentin to Daenerys. It had all come undone on the Dothraki Sea when he was murdered crowned with a pot of molten gold. 
He was killed by a Dothraki Kal, said Ariane, the Dragon Queen's own husband. So I've heard. What of it? Just, why did Daenerys let it happen? Viserys was her brother, all that remained of her own blood. The Dothraki are a savage folk. Who can know why they kill? Perhaps Viserys wiped his arse with the wrong hand. Perhaps, thought Ariane, or perhaps Daenerys realized that once her brother was crowned and wed to me, she would be doomed to spend the rest of her life sleeping in a tent and smelling like a horse. She is the Mad King's daughter, the princess said. How do we know? We cannot know, Sir Daemon said. We can only hope.